This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campania. Today, I'm excited to announce, uh, as I mentioned last week, we have Senator Stanley Chang, a new senator, uh, but he's not new to politics. He's been around for a little while. We're going to le learn a little bit about him, and we're going to talk about housing and homelessness here in Hawaii, and uh, ho you know, hopefully some ideas of what we're doing and what, what we're trying to accomplish in the future. So uh, thank you for joining us again, and let me welcome to the show Mr. Stanley, Senator Stanley Chang. Well, thank you so much for having me, Carl. Absolutely. I'm glad you can make it. So. Um, before we go into housing and homelessness, um, start by telling us a bit about yourself. Um, your District 9, Senate District 9, where is that? What does that encompass? I want to learn that. But before we get to that, what else have you done? What have you been doing? I, you, I know you were city council for a while. To give us a bit of Stanley Chang history, if you would. Sure. So um, the whole reason I wanted to get into politics in the first place goes back to my parents. They were both immigrants from China. My dad got here with nothing. He started out as a beach boy, um, but he was able to become a professor at UH, to work hard, to buy a home, to put my brother and me through school, give us all these opportunities we literally could never have had anywhere else in the world. Yeah. So what did he teach, if I may ask? He taught geography. Oh, I see. Yeah. Good. So, um, you know, fast forward to when I graduate from high school. About 90% of my class goes off to college on the mainland. Most have not come back. Um, my brother, for instance, who was a year behind me, he moved to Dallas, where he bought a house that's bigger, newer, nicer than our house here, and it was literally one-fifth of the price. Yeah. And so that is my biggest concern um, as a young person in Hawaii, that we, that we ensure that we have a good place to live where it is possible to work hard, have a family, to buy a home, to have a good life um, in this place that we all call home for every generation. In this place we call paradise and many of us call home and try to find a way to have that, even though it's Hawaii and we have to respect native Hawaiian values and, and cultures, that it is also an American dream that people are striving for and, Absolutely. and are having a hard time achieving. Absolutely. Yeah. And Hawaii is certainly not unique in that instance, but you know, we do have a median home price now of 795000 the highest wow. of any state, and uh, we have the highest percentage of both parents working in the country. We have the highest percentage of people working two or more jobs in the country, and we also wake up the earliest of any state in the country. And I think it's because a lot of people need to finish their first shift so that they can go to their second shift, sure. beat the traffic as well. So um, I was motivated to run for um, city council in 2010. Well, I should back up. So I went to Waikahala Preschool, Kahala Elementary, Iolani for middle and high school. We went to college and law school at Harvard, came back. Um, and practice law Thank here. you for coming back, by the way. As you mentioned, not everybody comes back. Well, yeah, um, it's great to be back. The brain I wish drain, people would come the back. The brain drain that we have here is, is, a, is a problem. That's a whole different episode, though. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. So um, I practiced law here downtown at okay. Cade Shuddy. Um, did some real estate law there. Then went on the campaign trail um, in 2010 for the city council district, uh, District 4, that goes from Ala Moana to Hawaii Kai and knocked on 19,000 doors and, and won, and so represented the East Honolulu area from 2011 to 2015. Um, at the end of that term, ran for Congress, the seat that was vacated when, um, uh, when Colleen Hanabusa um, you know, vacated her seat. Yeah, to um, run for Senate. That's right, and unfortunately didn't make it, mm. but uh, in 2016 ran for the state Senate, similar area from Diamond Head to Hawaii Kai, knocked on 16,000 doors, and we are and there you go so veteran door knocker and highly experienced so if you ever want to learn how to do that join senator chang i highly recommend that um okay so excellent well all right that's that's a that's a very specific arc now going back to just harvard for a minute what did you study in harvard what was your field what was your area undergrad i studied government mm -hmm. and law school um obviously went to law school and had a great time there too was there a focus in law school, or was it just getting a law degree? Uh, um, like some people focus towards, you know, you mentioned you worked in real estate. Others look at international law. Others look at uh, constitutional law. Was there an area of focus, or was it just um, the next step was I need my, I want my law degree because I want to then be able to do something with that? Well, um, I tried to get a broad kind of overview, and mm -hmm. so I took a lot of courses that I thought were, would be useful no matter what. Uh, so, for instance, I took tax law, which is not always the most 
know, scintillating <laughs> area of the law. But Some I, people go to sleep in that class. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, I have to say it was fascinating. And what I really learned is that the world goes round because of the Internal Revenue Code. Almost everything is the way it is because yeah. our tax structures, you know, um, That's put in these huge incentives for, you know, things to happen the way they are. That's, I would actually love to invite you back to another show to focus on that. I would like to learn more about that because that, I think, m is, is something that I don't think most people understand. We talk about yeah. the IRS and everyone's afraid of the IRS, although you don't need to be. And everybody is, is all worried about taxes and where their money goes and all that stuff. But having a different perspective on, by the way, this is how and why everything works and how government applies it, I think would be an interesting topic. So anyway. So sure. <laughs> so okay. So then you, so you came back, uh, worked for a while. And um, yes, you've, been, you've not been a center through one session. And uh, we're rolling into you know, the next session, and I know you're doing prep work with all that, which includes a lot of bill review ideas and, and uh, community outreach uh, as well, I would imagine. Um, one of the issues, and what we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of this uh, show, is going to be uh, housing and homelessness. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. It's a big concern. You'd already mentioned the median price of a house is $700,000 or, or above $700,000. Nobody can afford that. Very few people can afford that. Um, we hear all the time about, and the number has varied over the past several years. I've heard that we were 60,000 units short of, of housing. Now, what I've never quite understood is when we assess that, it's not just housing, because there's all these high rises going up. But were these high rises going up at six hundred thousand dollar condos? What can you be, begin to introduce us into? Um, I don't know your thought process anyway when it comes to the, our housing uh, concerns. What can we do? What are some of the thoughts that that have been rolling around in Senate that that you're talking with your constituents about with regards to housing concerns? The cost of housing, the availability of housing, whether we're 60,000 units short or 30,000 units short, and what that what is that conversation people are having or that you're having with people? Yeah, I think this is, like I said, you know, the most important crisis facing us because we have the highest cost of living in the country. The largest single piece of that cost of living is the cost of housing here in Hawaii. Um, another fun statistic, it takes longer in Hawaii to save for the average down payment with the average wage than anywhere else in the country. It takes 29 years to save for the average down payment with the average wage here, um, which is more than San Francisco, New York, a lot of the places that we think of as really expensive. Which is also the extent of a mortgage then. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so um, it should be no surprise that we're in the situation we're in because um, it's, uh, you know, basically housing supply has been capped for several decades now um, through a variety of measures, direct and indirect. And demand keeps going up due to the natural increase in the population, to immigration, the influx of you know, people who want to buy vacation homes and so forth. And as a result, you know, the price goes up. Demand goes up, supply is capped, price goes up. That's economics it, 101. It is exactly. It is to be expected. And it's actually very disappointing every quarter when I hear once again, oh, housing prices went up another some That's percentage. Right every quarter that's right it just makes it harder and harder for anybody whether you have a degree or not whether you're a lawyer or not it makes it harder and harder absolutely it's just to get by i mean it, y yes I, I absolutely agree housing is the first most expensive thing but then you have issues like daycare you have issues like education okay public school is one but not all public schools are equal and they certainly are not equal to private schools um, that's a whole separate topic, but as we're talking about going through the issues and concerns, it, it, housing is first. It follows other things. So, okay, so uh, we have our housing first plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, what, uh, can you tell us, what are your thoughts about the housing first plan? What have you, because uh, some of that started and there's been a huge conversation um, starting from city council that you're probably, uh, in, you were probably involved in and now into the Senate. As far as Housing First is concerned, what is your take on Housing First? I, I can certainly give some thoughts of my own, but I'd like to hear what, what, what your thoughts are with our Housing First plan. Yeah, so, um, well, Housing First is a strategy designed to combat homelessness, right. which is, you know, 
knocking on all those 16,000 doors, there were not a dozen issues, there were not five issues, there were not three issues, there was one issue that people cared about, and it was homelessness. And so, you know, just as a side note, um, I often think to myself, if other elected officials had to subject themselves every day, day in and day out, <laughs> to dozens, if not hundreds of people just, you know, getting on your case about homelessness, I, I also feel like, you know, it wouldn't just be one of many priorities in the state, it would be the top priority in the state. Um, and so, back to Housing First, it's a national best practice. Um, it's a way of combating homelessness by basically giving homeless people housing. Right. You know, no questions asked, uh, no rules, and so forth. Um, so that the people who are most vulnerable, the people who are often called the dual diagnosis people, those with both substance issues as well as mental health issues, that they can be brought off the street and into a stable uh, place to live as quickly as possible. And the studies show that reduces the um, you know, substance uh, consumption. That also dramatically reduces the amount of um, medical ER usage because there are people in Hawaii uh, the single highest user of emergency medical services in Hawaii is a homeless gentleman who um, used something like $1.2 million worth of emergency services in just one year of all of our tax dollars. And wow. $1.2 million, we could have bought him a yeah. really nice house at oh, that point. Absolutely. So um, it's designed to save everybody. Everybody wins with Housing First. You know, the homeless person gets off the street, their mental health and substance issues are ameliorated. Um, the taxpayer wins because it's much cheaper to offer this place to live than it is to treat them through the emergency system. And um, all of us get the advantage of a community that um, does not have uh, as much homelessness. Yeah, and that's one of the, one of the things. Now, uh, uh, sorry if it seemed like I sort of jumped into two different areas, but uh, housing and homelessness are very much, uh, I, I guess, you cannot extract one from the other. Um, Yes, we have a huge problem, depending upon who you talk to, is how many homeless people we have in any given moment in time in a year. Um, homelessness is an issue, but part of the reason homelessness is an issue is the number of people who are homeless and why they're homeless. Um, I, we recently, at my neighborhood board, we had Mark Alexander come and give us some thoughts on the Housing First program as well, uh, saying that looking good that we're on track is what he thinks. Okay, well being on track, and, and but looking at the statistics, uh, we're seeing that there actually are more homeless people. They're just being moved around. That's right. So what, I, 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 I want to better understand from the perspective of things cost too much, there aren't enough people, there aren't enough, there's not enough housing for all of the people, the housing that is there costs too much. We have people who have jobs but don't earn enough money to have a house who have jobs but have been out of a house for so long no one will rent them a house. We have situations and yet, and, and, and the numbers are, the statistics show that we have an increased number, but we're on track. I want to I want to better understand that. I don't imagine for a minute you have all the answers on this, but we need to start finding some solutions for this. And one of the things that, whether it's my neighborhood board or whether it's me walking through my community and talking with my, uh, my neighbors, it, it, it also comes up. But the issue that comes up is not so much that, yeah, I want to make sure that these people have a better life. It's, I don't want to see these people. I don't want to have to see these people when I drive to work every day. I don't want to have to fear that they're going to steal something from me or my neighbor. That seems to be a concern more so. And I guess coming from a, from a political perspective, whatever it is that drives enough of a I guess political base to say, yes, we are going to make this happen. Okay, fine. We can move something forward. But we have to take a quick break. Um, and when we come back, I want to see if we can dig into that a bit more and see what we can under, try to understand more about what's happening um, and what initiatives we might be able to take going forward. And I, anything I can do to ever help. Anyway, but anyway, again, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming to the show. Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. Uh, thanks again, my guest, uh, Senator Stanley Chang. We'll be back in one minute where we're going to talk more about housing and homelessness. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so far up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we 
Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others. And in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm joined today by my guest, Senator Stanley Chang. We're talking about housing and homelessness here in Hawaii. It's a big issue, a big concern. Thank you again for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, okay, uh, digging in a bit, as far as housing and homelessness, you'd mentioned all. You'd mentioned many of the factors that we've got. We've got non-local investors that come in, and whether they're coming in to buy some, I guess, vacation home or some rental property through the REIT program or other some other means. They're coming in, someone who's not local, buying housing way above and helps driving up the cost, number one. Uh, number two, uh, we've got low wages here comparative to what the costs of living are, being housing primarily being what that is because it just continues to go up. We have a Housing First initiative to try to address homelessness. We have high rises being built from Kaka'ako outward trying to make sure that we have more housing in more areas. Well, I, I think there's disconnect in some of that as far as how we get some of these people who are looking for a house into some of these homes um, and, 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 and so forth. I, I guess I want to dig in more and I want to find out, you know, from where we are, from what you've heard from your session in Senate uh, and, and from the halls of that building that's behind me, um, what are some initiatives that we might be able to take going forward? One of the thoughts I had, and I'll get your thought on this, because it's a bit, I don't want to give you a big open-ended question. One of the thoughts I had was, what about a rent control? What about creating a housing program that is rent controlled? Uh, has that, is that something that has been part of a discussion? Um, can it be part of a discussion? Um, you, you touched on a, on a huge variety of different I, issues. It, which I, um, then I tried to narrow it into <laughs> to one thought and we'll go from there. So, but, um, you know, we have a housing crisis. Yes. And so, should we look at programs like rent control? I think we should look at everything. Because we are not in a position to rule anything out at this point. Um, we have the highest cost of housing in the country. We have the highest percentage of renters versus owners in the country. We have the lowest percentage of owners mm -hmm. in the country. So, Especially local owners. That's right. So it's very important that we are not um, allowing rent increases to result in increased homelessness. Um, but that is just one facet of a very, very broad, you know, uh, a very, very broad set of measures that I think we should look at. First of all, and most basically, we do need to increase the housing supply. We, we just do. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, it's not just building more high rises. It's how do we how do we create more public private partnerships, or how do we work more with OHA or DHHL to try to say, okay, there's land, and we don't want to respect the land, but we also want to make sure there's more housing opportunity. Can we do that? What are the I mean, I, what are the thoughts? I, I just what I I want to I just want to know what is being talked about. What can we do? Yeah. Well. You answered your own question, Carl. You know, we, we do need way more high density uh, growth here uh, on Oahu. I don't want to see, you know, I, I was in Atlanta recently. I looked down from a tall building and as far as I could see, it was just forest. And I was like, wow, are there homes down there or is it just forest? And you no, know, they told me, no, no, they're homes. But the lots are half an acre, three quarters of an acre, one acre. And there's so many, you know, relatively small houses on huge lots. I don't think that should be the model for Hawaii. We should not have more urban sprawl just you know, across the landscape, taking up all of our agricultural, all of our conservation land. That is the least sustainable way that any society has ever learned how to live. And that's why we do need more high density, smart growth around transit corridors. That's what all the major cities of the world do. Um, and we should talk about ways that we can 
facilitate that. Now, it's, it's, it's not easy um, because, well, for a number of different reasons, um, but that, that is, I think, the only realistic solution to getting the number of housing units we need at, uh, you know, an environmentally sustainable manner. Yeah, I know I agree with that. And I think that, that brings it around to, that's the whole purpose, or one of, perhaps, the primary purposes of the rail. Right. Um, and it's one of the pieces that, that we don't really hear a whole lot. People talk about, oh, TOD, TOD, okay. What does TOD mean? It means transit, transit, orient, transit oriented development. Now, what does that mean? That means as we get to a rail station, and correct me wherever I'm wrong here, but as we get to a rail station, what you're going to end up having is businesses and housing that's around it because that's what helps make it more convenient to utilize that station. Now, where we're putting, well, at the moment, where ha we have all of these 21 stations currently lined out, many of them are currently in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. currently in the middle of a field. Some, uh, maybe it was, it maybe used to be some ag field and it isn't being used for that anymore, or maybe it still is, but okay. But that's the purpose, that's one of the purposes. So. So I guess that's uh, um, coming back around to the idea of, okay, how do we help address this problem? Now, when we talk about when Mark Alexander or when anybody else talks about, well, we're on a path to create this housing, is that what is really being considered or is that additional? Is, it, is, is that transit-oriented development part of what the plan is today or is that, well, we're not going to have that for 15 years, so we're trying to do stuff in the next five years and that'll be additional? Yeah, I think these are going to be more long-term initiatives. Um, Transit-oriented development is a 20, 50, even 100-year time horizon that we're looking at here. So these are not quick fixes. Um, you know, some of those empty fields that you're talking about would be where Ho'opili would be created, for instance. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying that Ho'opili is a good project or a bad project, but um, it has been tied up in court. Um, it's taken, I think, 20 or 30 years to bring even to this stage, which is still, you know, a ways out from the actual people moving in. Um, and it is not marketed towards mainland investors or outside investors. It is marketed towards local families. So um, that's an example of how difficult it is to build anything anywhere. Right. Um, and so I, one, one, you know, I, I would have liked to see that Ho'opili would be higher density to get that you know, mix of businesses, shops, uh, housing, all within walking distance of a transit center so that you don't need a car at all or you know, a two-car family can go down to a one-car family. Right. Um, that's been a very successful model in you know, virtually all of the major cities of the world. And at this point, I don't think we have the option to continue to do the you know, one person in one car down a long, you know, congested highway, you know, going, you, you know. You only have one road in exactly. and out, or maybe two roads in exactly. and out of. Right. Exactly, that's not a sustainable model of, of no, future and, growth. And that all goes back to, there wasn't a grand plan originally. It's just been how growth and development naturally and organically happens. All of a sudden things build up. There was a time that Kalihi was on the outskirts of town, was far away. The reason they put uh, OCCC out there was it was way out there. Nobody lived out there. Well, that's clearly not true anymore. <laughs> yeah. So as this unplanned organic growth happens, how do we, how do we address it? Well, I think we do need more planning, and Kapolei is actually a good example of that because Kapolei was planned, and Kapolei was unfortunately planned for that model of the one person and the one automobile, and that's, uh, you know, that that I think will be the last sort of example of that in Hawaii because uh, it is so unsustainable, and, and Kapolei is so unfriendly for walking uh, as a result. It's not, you know, a it's not a vibrant, uh, you know, highly dense community with a lot of options for transit the way that we right. would like our future communities to be. Right, right. And though the train now is going to start out there, but and hopefully that will facilitate that, that process. Can facilitate that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's you know that's what we need in the future in yeah. Hawaii, and it you know it's not a quick fix. And and so when we are looking at the quick fixes, we are looking at you know I mean the legislature has put a lot of resources behind you know. Um, low-income and workforce housing bonds and so forth designed to you know expand the supply and those are all great initiatives um, we definitely need more of that um, but you know even those are not quick fixes because to build anything in Hawaii is you know a years long time frame uh, not a months or even like a couple of years I mean we're talking several years yeah and so um, is there any quick fix I mean frankly not really 
You know, I, 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 quick fixes are always problematic anyway. I, I don't think that. Um, I don't think. Any, I think we need a combination of short term and long term. Uh, having a short term process that can help. I guess some of the challenges, but having it all build towards a longer term goal. And that's one of the things that I think that as the public, we're hoping that that's what our legislator is doing, legislators are doing, and, and our planners are doing, and all of our agencies are trying to work together towards, by the way, we're recognizing that the population is growing, we're recognizing these challenges, so we're trying to address that for the future and down the road. Um, and it, it seems like it is, but it always seems a little disconnected. And, and it's always fine to have political differences of opinion. Um, but sometimes that those differences of opinion impact the people negatively. And uh, I, I know that we have less of, a, less of a problem in some ways here, but um, I, won't, I won't go into that uh, too much. But um, OK, so housing is being worked on. There's issues, there are, the planning is going on. It, is the planning happening? Can you, from what you have seen, whether it's city and county or from the legislature side, is there planning happening such that people can start to understand and be, and when will we begin to really see it more than high rises? Because that's what everyone sees is high rises, high rises, high rises that I can't afford anyway. I'm not moving my family into that. But when, can we begin to see? And these are the problems. So now, I, some of this I'm just I'm handing to you, saying, please look into this. Please consider this. Please come back and let us know what is happening and what we can begin to expect to see, and when we can begin to expect to see some changes in that line. Yeah, um, and you know the short answer is these are all very long-term horizons. Um, the truth is there have been a lot of construction cranes that are very visible. There are high rises being built, but there are fewer new housing units being constructed or even permitted at this time than any time since World War II. You know, yeah. if you look at, you know, one of those new yeah. buildings, you might see 500 units. Hawaii Kai, you know, we're talking 10,000 units. But my, 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 my problem with that is, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, my problem with that is uh, we see that and we all know that it's three to $600,000 and someone making minimum wage here can't afford that and we'll never be able to afford that. And that's the gap that we need to fix. So uh, we, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, so thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, Performers, Politics, and Hawaii Series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. We have Senator Stanley Chang with us. As we go out, we have the rail issue coming up in the next, uh, next week or so. There's going to be potentially a special session. I don't know if there's going to be a special session. It's talked about. We've had information hearings. Can you lead us out? with, I don't know, your, your take, your impression, or, or some thoughts on the rail. Yeah, well, we're in a tough spot. There are a lot of hard questions that are going to have to be asked. Um, there's clearly a lot of accountability that needs to be there that's not there right now. Um, but at the same time, I haven't heard anyone say we should just abandon the project, tear down what's already been built, and start, you know, I guess, from ground zero again. Um, so I am committed, and I think, I hope our colleagues are also committed to bringing this project to a successful uh, completion in the most cost-effective manner possible. Yeah, thank you. You brought that all in, so thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you for coming thank on the you, show. Carl. Appreciate it's it. Thank you, It's been great. You're welcome to come back uh, really any time. Let's, let's talk about other issues. Let's dig in as much as we can. So again, thank you. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week when we're going to talk about our parole system next week. So be back. Thanks.